Welcome to Real Talk and ELT, a podcast that talks about the reality of teaching English. All right. Uh, so welcome back to another episode of Real Talk and ELT. I'm here with Tiago Silva. Hello. Hi there. <laughs> good morning. Hi. Sorry <laughs> you inviting me. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> of course. Uh, so let me introduce you, sir, and uh, then we'll get right into uh, some interesting topics. So Tiago Silva is a former air traffic controller and has almost 20 years experience as a teacher. He started off his teaching career as a maths teacher, but transitioned to English in 2013. He holds the CELTA, the CPE and train the trainer. Currently in addition, good thing we got train the trainer, right? Because that is going away. Did you know this? Really? Yeah, the programs that they're, they're, they're cutting it. How come? Did not know really? Yeah, I don't know why, to be honest. I don't know why, but yeah, they're they're cutting that program. So we okay. got in there just in time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, currently, in addition to preparing pilots and air traffic controllers to take their proficiency exams, he is a senior. Is it T E A C? Do you, or do you call it TEEK or? Yeah, you can call it TEEK. Um, test for English for aeronautical communication, radar for Lengau, is that? Uh, Lenguax. Lenguas. okay. UK and a checkpoint expert ex assessor for Latitude UK. Checkpoint is an, oh, okay, this was, I saw this too. I was like, oh good, for clarification. Checkpoint is an English assessment for student pilot selection and admissions. He's also a, hmm, acronyms i c a e a international sorry yeah my bad it's yeah. okay because uh, this is aviation aviation <laughs> is full of acronyms and initialisms this <laughs> is uh, you can call it ikea or ikea okay I mean, okay um international civil aviation english association board member a conference speaker and a consultant in the field of aeronautical english and oh radio okay Radio telephony communications? Radio telephony, yeah. Huh. Okay, well, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much once again. Let's get into English for specific purposes, shall we? <laughs> oh, yeah, <that's> <laughs> because all of those acronyms seem very, very specific. Um, <laughs> no, uh, first, actually, I just kind of wanted to to know how you went from math to air traffic control. I think it's math teaching, air traffic controlling, and then teaching English to air traffic. Yes, control. exactly. That, that's that's, that's the went? exact order. Yeah, okay. that's it. <laughs> so how did you know that what? happen? <laughs> yeah, I studied chemistry in high school. I mean, here in Brazil, we have, uh, uh, I mean, we graduate as a, a technician and then we go to university. And so before I go into university, I studied chemistry. So I, I really loved mathematics, physics, chemistry, and all that stuff. So I started teaching uh, in a, in a uh, friend of mine's uh, school, and then went to uni and studied mathematics. And that's what, that's what uh, mathematics was, was my thing, you know, I really loved, loved it. And uh, what, when, when I became an air traffic controller, uh, English is really important for air traffic controllers. Why so, did you choose that though? So you were teaching math and then you, I would assume you graduated from un university and then it was like, oh, I want to become an air traffic controller. No, you know, I, I graduated. So I was teaching, I had my own school. Okay. Uh, I lived at, at the time I lived in San Jose dos Campos. I was in the Brazilian army. I was a sergeant. So I, I wanted more. Mm. And then I did this uh, uh, entrance exam to become a civil servant, an air traffic controller and civil servant at the same time. And uh, as soon as I joined air traffic control, I saw that I needed to improve my English skills. Uh, okay. And that, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. but, but up to a point that I wanted to become an instructor because uh, in, in the Brazilian Air Force, uh, in, in the Department of Aerospace Control, we have controllers, but we also have English instructors. I mean, because to teach ESP, it's not an easy task. I mean, it, you don't have to be an expert. But what we do in aviation is that we combine uh, language experts and subject matter experts, and then we work together. So as an air traffic controller, I loved English at the time, but I wasn't that good. Not that I am right now, but anyway. Uh, and then I improved my skills. 
and then became an instructor in 2013. So yeah. hang on, go back again. There, when people are training for the the um, training people who work in the Air Force, you have content instructors and then you have language instructors. That's it. I said it. Wow. I said it in English for a whole month. You know, even before starting studying air traffic control, we would oh, go to, okay, so to the institute into... only English. Okay, so candidates coming into the Air Force, they stay and they study language before they even study the content that they're going to. Or, that was my case, or but vice it versa. varies. Yeah, okay. It varies. Okay. In my case, that, that's how it happened. Mm. But let's say if uh, a student goes to... The, the training, uh, the air traffic control training center uh, to become uh, a sergeant air traffic controller, which is different, then they will have English throughout the two, the two years uh, of their training. What's the difference between a regular air traffic controller and a sergeant? Are, are we just talking about military person? The vast, and yeah, civilian? the vast majority of Brazilian air traffic controllers are in, in the military. They are Air Force sergeants, Why the vast majority, because this is how the system works here in Brazil. So you know? it's unusual to see a civilian air traffic controller here in Brazil. Yes, pretty interesting. Much. Okay, pretty much. even at the like commercial airports. Mm, yes, yes, even at commercial airports. Okay, <laughs> fair. No, I, I because I think that that's. Un unusual actually that most of them are military. I, I, I don't know I don't know the exact numbers but let's say ballpark 3000 uh sergeants and 500 civilians oh okay so overwhelming percentage are military yes. personnel uh -huh. yeah okay mm -hmm. Okay, so then <laughs> now we'll have to go back to your story. So <laughs> because I'm trying to to figure it out, it, it, it's it's a uh, it's very unfamiliar for me. I guess we can talk about most people and most people it is yeah. <laughs> because air traffic controlling is such a specific job, and so maybe you can give some insights into what is an air traffic controller in terms of a daily routine. Like, what does that mean, and how does English integrate into that? Sure, yeah. What we don't do is to signal uh, using those... That's the uh, ground crew. Red, yeah, that's the marshaller. What the marshaller. Uh, those are marshallers. Uh -huh. They help planes. Uh, they guide planes uh, onto uh, the parking area. Mm -hmm. you know? So what we do is that we talk to pilots, we give them instructions in order to separate them in the airspace. Mm -hmm. In order for them not to not to collide with each other, yeah. A very important job, high risk yeah. job, high super high risk. Super, 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 you know. And then English is international language, uh, or more specifically, it's what we call the lingua franca of aviation. You know, it used to be France, French, a long, long time ago, but for quite some time, English uh, has become the the lingua franca of aviation. So uh, all over the world, people speak English, uh, pilots and air traffic controllers. Unless they are uh, talking to uh, local pilots, so local air traffic controllers speaking Portuguese, like here in Brazil, they speak speaking Portuguese to Brazilian uh, pilots. It's not man mandatory that we speak in English. However, if a foreign pilot comes from anywhere, I mean, could be even within the country, I mean, a pilot from uh, Brazil to Rio, if he wants to speak English, we will, air traffic control, we will speak in English to this pilot, okay? And you guys work in the towers, I'm assuming? Mm, yeah, but yeah. Or no, yeah. is that a misconception? Yes, because uh, there are more, I mean, uh, the towers, uh are in airports i mean mm -hmm. uh, each airport has at least one tower okay. however uh the controllers who work in towers they mm -hmm. rely on their uh vision i mean they control what they see okay however there are radars and radar controllers mm -hmm. and radar controllers work work in rooms 
And different, uh, there are different types of radio controllers. There are the approach controllers, and uh, they work uh, in places like Sao Paulo. There are uh, more than one airport, mm -hmm. Brasilia. Uh, Brasilia, because even though there is only one, if I'm not mistaken, it's a really busy uh, airspace. And also in Salvador, uh, Natal, so some specific places, you'll find uh, approach controls. And then uh, it, it works like this. The aircraft uh, is uh, parked, and then it starts the engines off, start the engines up, and then starts taxiing, talking to a controller, a tower controller. And then the tower controller gives clearance for this pilot to take off. And then as soon as the pilot takes off, he contacts, contacts the approach controller. You know, and uh, as soon as the pilot reaches a certain level, then he contacts the center controller or area controller or en route controller. Okay, so it's like it. multiple people then? Yeah, at least at least three different controllers. Or and that's just, on, that's, that's just on takeoff. And then I'm assuming on descent yeah. too, there's probably... Similar. The other way around, yeah. But okay. the other way around, okay. He's talking to Santa, and then as he descends, he at some point talks to approach control, and then uh, when he joins the final approach, which is the final segment uh, before touching mm -hmm. the ground, he talks to a, a tower controller again. So multiple controllers, only the tower. Uh, can use visual cues. They're they're the ones that rely on exactly. on their mm -hmm. visual cues, but everybody else is relying on radar. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So instrumentation mm, needs to be key and and working and functioning properly. But there are many redundancies. Of course. Yeah. 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 So then, uh, what what was your capacity? Were you in the tower or were you uh, on the always? Uh, I work as a tower controller for. 15 years, you know, 15 years. Do you have a preference? I, I, don't, I, I can't say I have a preference because I've never worked uh, in a different facility. Okay. I'm not even qualified because to be qualified to work as, a, as an approach controller or a center controller, you need to do a course, oh. a specific course to, to know how to operate uh, the radar. So you need different skills. Okay. So, and uh, is there a hierarchy amongst the controllers? Mm, I mean, uh, between tower, uh, um, among tower, uh, mm -hmm. no, no. No, it's, it's all, all okay. the same. Here okay. in Brazil, all the same. Okay. D but I mean, <laughs> outside the, I mean, uh, outside Brazil, depending on the country, you may have different uh, hierarchies. I mean, different. Uh, Gonna put ranks, but not here in Brazil. So the the next question that I have is because we've got the three different uh, kind of areas we can call it three different functions. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. But do they, in terms of they need to use English? So how much English do they actually have to use? Because it seems as if it is more of a repetitive interaction with the exception of emergencies or differentiated things so isn't it kind of a repetitive thing or is that a mis another mm -hmm. misconception yeah it's not, it, it is interesting that you asked this question because even some controllers have this idea that uh, what we do is repetitive and therefore we don't need to learn english we only need to master uh phraseology which is the language we use most of the time but that's a misconception because uh depending on where you work so i worked here uh in rio for at least one year before quitting uh because i quit last november and uh i spoke more english than portuguese you know so i i had more uh interactions in english than i had in portuguese because here we have Argentina, uh, Chile, and uh, British Airways coming to Rio, uh, United Airlines, American uh, Air France. 
So on a daily basis, I spoke more English than Portuguese. And situations vary. And sometimes, uh, even though it's not an emergency, we need to speak English that is not phraseology. Let's say uh, the pilot has a question about something, about the facility, about uh, the weather somewhere else. So, you know, uh, so let's say there's a problem with his flight plan and uh, or we do have something that he needs to do before his flight. So that's not phraseology. And that's not an emergency, an emergency. So we need to have the skills to, to manage the situation and speak what we need to this pilot. And is the, the language that you use, I mean, because you're communicating via radio and I always find mm -hmm. radios to be quite difficult to understand, even, you know. Oh, you, get, you get used to it. It is in the very beginning, yeah. But things ha have changed. I mean, the quality today uh, is, is really good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you get used to it, really, you know. As time goes by, you get used to it. Okay. And once but, again, but the language it, we use mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on a regular basis is what we call standard phraseology. Mm. And when standard phraseology doesn't suffice, we resort to what we call plain, plain language, which is basically uh, phraseology-like with the difference that it's not written in a manual. We need to create spontaneously plain language. Okay. But it has to be precise. It has to be concise. That's what I was going to ask because also you're unambiguous. talking, but you can't, you can't like have this conversation like we're exactly. having here. This is not, well, exactly. let me explain this in great detail. It needs to be much more uh, tailored to communicating on radios, I imagine. That's it. Yeah. That's okay. It. So then how, how exactly would you, for people who are interested or for people who are thinking about, well, okay, this is kind of an interesting, I'd like aviation or what um what are some things that you see frequently in like needs analysis when you're looking at student like potential students people that come to you like how do you assess what they need how do you determine syllabus and curriculum with because this is very very specific yeah much as i agree with you i mean it's it's an easy task because uh the iku which is the international civil aviation organization uh has written a couple of documents and one of them is doc or document 9835 and everything we need to know is there you know syllabus done <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> everything virtually okay. everything is there but what we do is that we ask uh, uh possible clients so what is what is it that you want uh, do you want to take the exam because here in Brazil, uh, pilots or pilots regulations are written and overseen by uh, ANAC, which is the National uh, Civil Agency, Civil Aviation Agency. And air traffic control is overseen by uh, DSEA, which is the Department of Aerospace Control. And uh, there are different exams. So pilots take one exam, which is the Saint Dumont English Assessment. And the air traffic controllers do a, a different exam. They take a different exam, which is called a police. I don't remember what a police uh, stands for. I there's think it's just... something uh, English proficiency, <laughs> language, something. There's so many acronyms we can't keep track of. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my bad. But no, anyways. it's fine. So they, there's two different exams for pilots and for air traffic controllers. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I shall. That's that's what it is. And then we, well, yeah, uh, I myself, uh, so. Do you want to take the exam? Do you want to study to prepare for the exam? Or do you want to study English for life? I mean, to, to improve your skills and to become a better uh, controller or to become a better pilot or because you want to travel uh, abroad. I mean, I have two students who fly only internationally. They don't fly uh, domestically, locally. They only fly to the, U the US, to Europe. And they've been doing that for four to five years now, you know. So they want to learn because they need to take the exam from time to time, depending on, on your level of proficiency. You, you must uh, reset the, the test. 
but regardless of the test, they want to improve their English skills because they are talking to controllers, let's say in J from JFK, you know, which is terrible because they speak too fast and they use jargon. Oh, Americans, are not. they're terrible. And to make matters worse, <laughs> the phraseology they use is different from the phraseology we use in Brazil, here in Brazil. Believe it or not, yeah. They use uh, FAA uh, phraseology, which is a little bit different from IKO phraseology. Are they the only ones that use FAA, Americans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like using the metric system and then using the... <laughs> uh, you know you did, you know you did. You see, we like to complicate things. We don't, we... <laughs> we don't want to make it easy for anybody to come Just into the to country. Give you... Uh, an illustration of what it means. Recently, we've been seeing some uh, close calls in the US and uh, US controller, American controllers, they, let's say, uh, the aircraft is coming into land and there's another one that is ready for takeoff. Uh, so this one that is ready for takeoff uh, enters the runway and start rolling for takeoff. So the runway is occupied. There's an aircraft there. So you can't land another aircraft on that same runway until the, 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 the aircraft that is taking off uh, leaves the runway. But in, in the US, they clear, they approve the landing of the incoming traffic. Even though there's another plane on the runway, they approve the landings of the incoming traffic. So basically, that's what happened with the FedEx and the Southwest. The aircraft Those enter, recent, entered the room. Right? Yes, yes. I mean, it's not, a month. Yeah, because I was watching a, oh, the things that I do. I was watching a congressional hearing because they're, the senators and congressmen were... <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded, so you know you can find them on YouTube. They're they're quite interesting, actually. I mean, you could probably use them for lessons. But they were interviewing the um, oh gosh, I don't know what the official name is, but it kind of like the TSB. No, the president for F the FAA. They they were they're going to like put a new person in charge of that, and they were interviewing him, and he they were asking questions. Um, and he has military, uh, has a military background in aviation. I don't know if he was a pilot necessarily or an air traffic controller. I don't know what his function was in the Air Force. Um, but he, they were asking him about that specifically. And even he, this candidate to take over the FAA, he was like, I would have to look at the documentation. I mean, uh, it was just. Yeah, that's true. You, you, you need to take it with a pinch of salt because, yeah, you, you can't jump to conclusions before everything has been investigated yeah. yeah that's something that's uh this is how aviation works you know you can just assume things and you need to wait until everything uh has been i mean really kind of looked at you know, look, yeah exactly and then okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna go back circle back to one thing because you said that pilots and air traffic controllers take different tests and then sometimes they take english just because they need to improve because we use or we <laughs> they use like plain english that's kind of you know structured in a specific way what do the tests look like because when we think of, i mean if we're english teachers and we think of exams then we automatically think of like cambridge suite exams or the you know all of the different proficiency exams is it similar to that or is it more content based that happens to be in the lingua franca it happens to be in english both 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 tests i mean all tests they have uh tasks but the the main difference between aviation uh, proficiency exams and cambridge exams for example is that cambridge exams are taken in in, in pairs or in trios those exams, aviation uh, English exams, are taken individually. So it's you and the interlocutor and the examiner. You know, uh, uh, for SDEA, I call it SDEA, but it's the Saint Dumont English Assessment uh, by Anaki. Uh, the two uh, assessors are together in the room, so the interlocutor and the examiner, pretty much like the Cambridge exams. And and then there's a candidate. 
uh, when it comes to a please, the, the exam that controllers take, there's an interlocutor, and then everything is recorded, and then the recording is sent to the, the examiner. Yeah. Not that the Santos Dumont, the, the, the exam for pilots is not recorded. It is. It has to be, you know? But, but it's assessed uh, there as opposed to yeah, being assessed exactly. yeah. at a later yeah, on time. the spot. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. spot. And what do and they, they do? What do they, what kind of, I mean, you haven't, I'm basically they you... are asked questions. Oh. They are asked questions and they uh, need to interact. Uh, for pilots, they need to interact as a pilot. So they will listen to uh, radio communications and they need to respond accordingly. And then at some point they need to understand uh, the, a, a certain turn of events and tell what happened, what the problem was. And then there's a picture. Mo most exams all over the world will uh, give candidates a picture, show them a picture and they need to describe, to tell what is going on. And then they will be asked some questions uh, related to the, the the topic of the shown in the picture. So this, I, I think, this gives you a, a good summary of all exams. And it's just world. oral. It's just a speaking exam. They just go in and interact, and then that that's yeah, it. Because that's all we do. We need to talk. We don't need to write anything in air traffic control. Although pilots do need to write stuff, they need to read manuals, but uh, the aeronautical uh, English exams, uh, they only. Uh, focus on uh, speaking and listening. That's the only focus. So, so how does that, that, so how does that change the the dynamic in your cl classes? I mean, because we would they do need um, air traffic controllers too, right? They I'm assuming they have manuals and they have to study things and try to understand. But everything is in Portuguese. Yeah, they don't need to read anything in English, oh. apart from the standard phraseology, but. Uh, there is a translation. There, there is a, the Portuguese phraseology and side by side, and the English phraseology side by side. So, so then what? Okay. So then what do? You, <laughs> okay. So then how how are the how are the classes? Are they just like a normal class for you teaching aviation English? You can do if it's po possibly it's the same for pilots and for air traffic controllers. But what does it look like in terms of like how do you? attend to those very, very specific needs? Yes, uh, yeah, this is a tricky question because it's been a while since I last uh, taught a, a regular lesson. I mean, a lesson that covers all the, the, the skills. Yeah, like, because you have, okay, so you have the experience of doing CELTA and things like that. So we, we've seen this type of like standardization or working in in i don't know if you've ever had the experience of working in like a language institute and so we have this idea oh, yes. of like uh teachers sometimes say well this is what a lesson is this is what a lesson should be right because though if you're taking like formal courses like celta like we've both done celta for example oh that well, that's a very specific question. framework and it's a very specific assessment by the tutors to, for you to be able to apply certain principles and concepts and follow a framework that is not i'm assuming what you do on a day-to-day -day basis so what yeah, it's, it is. <laughs> so... Yes, we follow the same framework yeah we do the same so let's say we are using ppp so we have the leading or uh, if that's not the first very first lesson we can have a warm-up so yeah so just to engage students and then we move on to the presentation then practice, uh, controlled practice, your practice, and then production. We, we, we need to follow the same framework. Okay, so know? then that's so how then we are that's trained. Helpful. Okay. And then, but the content that you use, do you, do you tend to follow? Because, reg, okay, regular, I'm going to put quotes around this because it's kind of a huge generalization, but regular teachers have some freedom in terms of they can get creative and they can use different materials and things like that. And I think I've seen Nathalia posting something about teaching aviation with music. I think it was her, someone had posted something like that. Do it you... was her through uh, NIONU, which is the Instagram page. Yes, yes. By, uh... Uh, by Natalia and her uh, 
colleagues. So then, so how, how much freedom do you have? Or do you have to really follow a structure? Like, is it, are you able to be creative? And, and yes, we, we are. And we because should it seems be. very limited, but it isn't, right? Sorry? It seems very limited that, oh, I have to follow the, the like this book and it has everything written. Out. But not actually, because I mean, okay. I think you have what you have in mind is that uh, we teach phraseology, but we don't, you know? Yeah, we do teach phraseology, but in a different setting. When it comes to uh, uh, exam preparation, we do need to use the same frameworks that regular teachers use and to be creative as much as we can, you know, to engage students. Otherwise, they will find it boring and then they won't learn the same way, you know. So I do need, I do, I do use videos. Like today I'm teaching a lesson and I'm going to use a, a uh, snippet from Friends, the, the TV show. Yeah. How, uh, okay, can you just go through that? Material. Yeah, it's, how, how I don't, do you don't, don't know if you remember it, but there's a there's an episode uh, in which uh, Rachel is going somewhere by playing, and then Phoebe and uh, Ross are going to meet her at the airport and try and uh, convince her to not to go, and then Rachel uh, Phoebe says something about the left phalange. There's a problem with the left phalange. And then they are on the phone. Uh, and then Rachel uh, speaks it uh, in a loud tone. I mean, loudly. And people uh, on the plane they listen to her. And what? What is going on here? And then she says, "Oh, my friend had a feeling that there's a problem with the left phalange, but there's no phalange. I mean, it was a, a made a part that Phoebe uh, came up with to try and convince uh, Rachel not to go." So this is a leading, I mean, the lesson is about parts of, of uh, an airplane. So I use this <laughs> as a leading. I love it. No, it's fun. It's fun because it, it gets them kind of interested in what's going on, interested in the topic of parts. Sometimes when, when the pilot is not uh, experienced, they do believe there is a phalange. So uh, <laughs> in the end, we tell them, so. Where is the phalange? Show me the phalange. And then, ah, I think it's this part here. Come on, there's no phalange. It's a made up part. But they, they, well, yeah, it's true that that's not the appropriate name for it, but they were trying to kind of understand what she was referring to. You know, like she's referring to, I'm assuming the wing, I'm assuming. No, she just, I mean. Oh, she just, is good. <laughs> yeah, nothing. came up with it. Okay, okay. All right, yeah. so then there is a, a bit of creativity. And then your experience as an air traffic controller obviously makes it a lot easier for you to understand the scenarios and, 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 and what's right. So, but there are people like uh, a colleague of ours, Natalia, who work with this as well. And if, if I'm not mistaken, she didn't work in aviation, right? No, no. Like she, she has no doesn't have a, an aviation background. Yeah, she doesn't come from an aviation background. So you have this advantage because you've worked with it. And then there's people who like Natalia, who's an excellent teacher. Uh, but she can, you know, go into the. So how do people who are interested in something that's so English for specific purposes? How how can someone prepare themselves? Yeah, specific, yeah. <laughs> Well, first of all, uh, they need to start at some point. Yeah, so like uh, Natalia, she joined uh, the, the Air Force and she had no experience in the very beginning. So what, she, what, what, you, what you can do is to uh, try and, and, and talk to people, to study, to watch uh, videos, uh, to listen to podcasts. Uh, and obviously to, to, to study the documents, because let's say uh, the doc, doc 9835 as, uh, that I mentioned before, uh, everything that a teacher needs to know is there. Syllabus, what you should teach, what you shouldn't teach, what you don't need to teach, everything is there. And uh, what pilots need to, to, to know, 
what controllers need to know. So everything is there, you know? So that's the, 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 the basics, you know? To study IKO documents related, related to language proficiency, you know? And then, as I said, to become uh, as much familiarized as aviation terms as you can, like watching films, uh, documentaries, and uh, everything there is available uh, that can help you, help you uh, become familiarized with aviation. But uh, nothing beats uh, time. I mean, as time goes by, you get the hang of it. But of course, you need to, to talk to people to work uh, with uh, experts because you on your own, if you, if you uh, stay limited in your bubble, you won't grow professionally speaking. That's what I was wondering is if it's like, because there's a lot of people that maybe would want to, and I'm not sure how common this is to have pilots or air traffic. I'm assuming air traffic control is probably not, but maybe pilots who want to learn English or better their English. Do they ever really look for private teachers or? Oh, yeah, yeah. They do. Or is it mm -hmm. more that they, they rely on the specific institutions or the Air Force to kind of provide this training? I don't even know if the, the Air Force provides that type of training, oh, like ongoing they don't. training. I they mean. don't. They don't. Not for pilots. Hmm. Unless we are talking about military pilots. Okay. But uh, civil pilots, they need to uh, rely on institutes, like you said, or on private tutors, like hmm. me, like many others uh you can find out there okay and then uh because we know natalia well, i'm gonna have to get her on the podcast soon but natalia yes. she <laughs> she joined the air force but is that a requirement for her to be one of the tra trainers I'm, I'm not even sure of the official title yeah mm -hmm. okay trainer teacher or a uh, rater she's also a rater examiner so you have to be in the, uh, technically in the military to be able to do that. No, not actually, because she's not in, in the military. I mean, we, we, we work, I mean, I work and she works. She's a civil servant. Okay. Because uh, in the Air Force, there are the military personnel and the civilians, mm -hmm. the civil servants, mm -hmm. you know, and she, she's a civil servant, just like I was. And then what, oh, okay, so you become a civil servant. I'm assuming you have to do the concourse and things like that. Like you have to go through the process. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a specific entrance exam to, to be uh, a civil serv servant for the Air Force. Ah, uh, okay. What does that look like? <laughs> I mean, uh, it's not common, especially these days, you know. The I mean, last is there one. high demand for this or, or not really? Oh, no, 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 not really. It should, there should be, but yeah. Okay. Well, well I, I, don't, I don't know. Is the, are you in, like, is there a, a need for more trainers, for more teachers? Of course. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's, exactly. it's just not common to find the, the, the entrance exam. Let's, let's talk about Natalia. Natalia is the, the, the only English specialist in Sao Paulo. So, Sao Paulo and Rio. Oh, it's wow. responsible for Sao Paulo and Rio controllers. She's the only language expert, the only one. And Rio, in Rio, there are more than 200 air traffic controllers, only in Rio. Okay, that's a lot. Sao Paulo, I may well be mistaken, but I think there are more than 400. Oh, so that's, that's a huge amount of people. for, And it, she's responsible for training all of them. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're not the only the only uh, instructor teacher. She's the, the only teacher, but there are more other instructors who mm -hmm. are air traffic controllers. But it's it's not enough for language. It's it's her. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So then, what does sorry? What does the uh, exam? If people are interested or, or curious about it, because I'm gonna, I'm not interested. I don't want. <laughs> I don't think I could deal with with pilots and air traffic. I don't know why. I don't. It's just not kind of a a thing for me. But it, it is curious though. I would like to see like 
okay, so what's the, the entry exam look like? And then what is that for? I mean, to become an air traffic controller. Not to become an air, to become the language expert for the air traffic controller. Oh, yeah, as I said, is it just not a regular? A... No, it, it isn't. It oh, okay, isn't. it's different. Everything yeah. specialized here. As I said, <laughs> the last uh, exam, uh, entrance exam, was uh, took place almost ten years ago. Oh my God! Yeah, if, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, it was in 2013 or something. Mm -hmm. And what's, yeah. the, what's the exam comprised of? I mean, it's not something, is it something you prepare for or not really? Is it... Well, basically, uh, you'll, there, there will be the Portuguese, mathematics, uh, maybe physics. And if it's for teachers, uh, it's, it's different. Then uh, you'll have to, to teach a lesson, something like that. Okay. All right. I really don't know exactly. Uh, as soon as you have I mean, Natalia I mean, with you, you ask her, but yeah, yeah, but because the one I took is different, was different because uh, the one I took was to be a, an air traffic controller, so it was completely different. What does that exam look like for air traffic controllers? Because air traffic controlling for someone who speaks English is it's a, a, a good job, like a very reliable job, right? I mean, it's not something that's we always have air traffic controllers, no, or no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But again, as I said, yeah, you can join the military, the Air Force, but there is a a, a a range. I mean, you need to be between eighteen and uh, twenty three years old. You can oh, be so older not, than twenty three or twenty four. You're you're ineligible. Yeah, you can't be older than twenty four. I think. <gasps> it has the military requirements on it too because i was mm -hmm. thinking okay follow my thought process here for a second air traffic controlling i mean aviation is global right and so we always need air traffic controllers regardless of where you live so air traffic controlling you could start for example here in brazil but if you speak english and and you have this skills besides going to the united states who likes to adhere to the faa rules if you follow okay. that ICAO, right? You could you could go to Europe. You could work internationally as an air traffic controller. Mm -hmm. I mean, technically speaking, right? It doesn't. It doesn't. Oh, you're right. You're right. Okay. So I mean, and it's not a. a I don't know. I don't know your opinion, but it it doesn't seem as if it's a terrible uh, career path because no, it isn't. Right. It isn't. The point is, here in Brazil, uh, if you are in the military, then you you have these steps. Yeah, you have the ranks, so you start off as a sergeant and then you become a chief master sergeant after 20 years or something. And then you can become an officer, like a lieutenant, a captain, and even uh, reach the, ra the rank of colonel. Uh, Wait, you guys don't have non-commissioned officers and commissioned officers? But controllers are always, uh, I think, non-commissioned. I mean... Uh, here we call uh, temporary, I mean, uh, temporario here in Brazil. Oh. And uh, the the ones that are not temporarios uh, are, I think they are commissions, yeah? Yeah. And then commission is those who Like uh, lieutenant, work until... captain, colonel, those are commission. I, I'm going from American military. That's why. Uh, because we have here we have two different circles: the sergeants, the the circle, the, the sergeant circle. Yeah. So you start as a sergeant, and then you go and you move up until you become a chief master sergeant. Okay. And then there's the officers uh, circle. You start off as a, a lieutenant, and then you reach. Uh, you can reach colonel and brigadier would be the generals the top. and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, general. Yeah. Uh, but I think I thought non-commission would be those who reach retirement or are able to reach to work until retirement. Is that right? No, no, it's different. Well, it's different for us. I mean, this is my from my limited military experience. There's commissioned officers and there's non-commissioned officers. So non-commissioned is like 
uh, private, corporal, sergeant. Uh, okay. And okay. those are people that you can have um, positions of authority or leadership in terms like once you're a sergeant, you can be like squad leader or, or things like that, up to first sergeant. Um, yeah, so they're, they have their own hierarchy and structure. But what happens is those are people who don't have college educations, who are not graduated from the university. And so they can, they will always be below a commissioned officer. Commissioned officers are those that have university degrees. I see. And so it's the same. They start from lieutenant, goes all the way through like captain, major, lieutenant, colonel, colonel. It goes all the way through um, to general. But those are people who have graduated from university and have become commissioned. So you'll always have like, if you have a sergeant, that's a, let's say, um, uh, well, yeah, you can have like a squad leader, for example, because they have like the different company structures. So you could have like a sergeant or a first, um, yeah, we'll just say sergeant first class, something like that. The sergeant first class would always report to a commissioned officer, which would, in that case mm. would probably be the lieutenant. Yeah, I think it's pretty much the same here yeah. in Brazil. Yeah. yeah. But so, so to, yes, as you said, you can have controllers who start off as non-commissioned and, and then, then they eventually become, become commissioned. Yeah. commissioned. Yeah. But they stop controlling. They don't control anymore and they become commissioned. Oh, uh, so it's only non-commissioned officers. officers. Yes, mm. that's, that's it. What do they, mm -hmm. If they become commissioned, then what do they do? Ah, they become uh, managers. Ah, okay. Facility, facility managers. It's the same then, yeah basically facility managers, but they can also uh, design procedures and traffic control procedures. Hmm. And usually th that's the, what they do when they become lieutenants. But the only way for people to become air traffic controllers here in Brazil is, well, no, not the only way, because you said that there's probably the vast majority are in the military. What about the people who are non-military? Yeah, they, some of them were, uh, worked for, for the uh, Infraero, which uh, is a former Brazilian. It actually was a, a mixed uh, enterprise, part, uh, part uh, governmental and part pr uh, private company. Okay. But uh, now it's, uh, it, it has become an, agent, an agency, uh, which is uh, Navi Brazil, uh, so uh, I don't know what NAV stands for. I think it's navigation, Acron probably. <laughs> Acronyms again, it's fine. I, I do think it's navigation, but it's it's a, 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 an agency. And probably there will be in one or two years time, there will be a, a, an exam to, to, I mean, admit new controllers mm. uh, uh, into this new enterprise, you know, but uh, there are, I mean, the, the number is really limited, but there are some uh, facilities in some places, like in Jundiaí, in Ribeirão Preto, some private towers mm. to hire controllers. So they are not in the military. Okay. They are controllers that are not working for the, the Air Force anymore, and they, they can be, be hired by those small uh, companies who run small towers. Go like on. uh but usually they're uh, former military usually yeah usually well, i could go and work in those places if i wanted to well, but if i wanted to of course i i i would need to be hired i need to pass the <laughs> come to Jinjai, you'll be near me <laughs> it's nice Jinjai, not, it's nice yeah. they say i'm not sure if it is but they say it's <laughs> nice and then there's catarina londrina some places uh in brazil who hire uh, uh controllers uh who used to be uh, work for the air force so that's interesting the 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 ones who aren't in the air force are former military because that's the only that's the only way of becoming an air traffic controller here yeah because let's say uh if somebody wanted to become an air traffic controller but not work for the air force mm. as you you take uh exams like uh to work for nati brazil or you can't because uh nobody uh prepares air traffic controllers 
is that is that the same in the other, air force yeah is that this i i obviously think it's not the same in the u.s because there are air traffic controllers that have nothing to do with military but how hmm, how then would would could somebody from like outside brazil come and work as an air traffic controller or no 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 not here in brazil oh it may be possible in the u.s i don't know but in europe I know it's possible in Australia, but in, in Canada, it's common. There are a couple of Brazilians who went to Canada and um, became air traffic controllers there. So the and reverse it, is possible. It, um, yeah, but not the other way around. Not, no. Oh. Even though they speak Portuguese, because you need to you need to be Brazilian to become uh, an air traffic controller. You have to be a citizen. And some people, yeah, that's a requirement. Uh, to become a military air traffic controller, uh, you need to be born here in Brazil. But this is in, oh, I didn't know this, Tiago. Yeah. I had no mm -hmm. idea that it, it, that it was such that it's like a, like a closed circle that it's not open where people. Oh, I would like to become no, one. It's fine. I, I may be wrong, but what I know is that to become a commissioned officer, you must be Brazilian. You know, oh. you must be Brazilian. But to become a sergeant, I think you may only be a citizen. Interesting. Interesting. It's a it's a tight knit little circle. It's very exclusive. Yes, <laughs> and and do you uh, do you have any? I know that you you recently left. Are you going to focus on? And I'm just asking you personal questions now. But um, are you going to for, focus on just teaching, or are you thinking of getting back into controlling as well? I really don't think so. I mean, teaching is something I've been doing for quite some time, mm -hmm. and it's my true passion. Okay. And uh, one of the reasons I left is that I really wanted to 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 focus on teaching specifically you know because uh as you know i did the celta the train the trainer mm -hmm. and the next step in my career would would be to to do the delta you know so okay. and that that's what I, i'm planning on to start studying because I, I i did start studying for the delta but things got crazy during the pandemic and i needed to stop but the idea is to resume my studies and to go for the delta maybe uh, next year probably next year and after the delta to maybe uh, try and join a master's program mm -hmm. and uh, have you um have you decided or have you even thought about will you stay with aviation or do you think that you'll you'll expand a little bit yeah probably i'll stay in aviation you would i would be stupid if I, or silly at least if i left the field because i have the experience of uh, having been an, an air traffic controller so yeah people know me from what i did from uh everything that i that i did and been through uh when i was an air traffic controller you know so i, I have many um I know a lot of people in the field, you know, and as part of the International Civil uh, Aviation English Association is something that is not common. I mean, there are many members, but board members, only a few. Mm. And I was invited in 2021, 20, you know, and it was a big, a huge achievement. You know, there are only uh three brazilians in the association association so it's me and two other uh researchers one is malila prado she works li lives and works in china and another, another one is anna monteo who lives in, in canada i think she's i don't know what she's doing there at research but she, she works for anaki so and there's me a, a re regular a former air traffic controller who teach English for aviation. So compared to those people, you know, I think it's a, a huge achievement. And and that's for what organization again? You said. So it's IKEA or IKEA International Civil Civil Aviation English Association. And and 
That's big. It's different from IKO. IKO is a UN uh, organization. Mm. I, IKEA is not. Okay. But it, it does help IKO when it comes to language proficiency. Okay. And what's the what's kind of the the, the purpose of this I, IKEA or IKEA? It's basically to help the community improve uh, language proficiency and uh, also to help uh, providing guidelines for testing because tests is, tests vary uh, all over the world. So we need to have uh, standards. So the association is helping uh, develop and design guidelines to improve standardization and harmonization when it comes to test development. Obviously, standardization within test development is kind of important. I mean, it, it will help with the... I guess, effectiveness of air traffic control, right? Because then if you have good testing standards and practices, then everybody's kind of speaking the same language. Everybody's on the same That's page. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm. if you know uh, a certain test is reliable because it follows some standards, you know, okay, I can trust those controllers because they been through this specific test and it's really reliable. So I, I know it's safe to fly. Uh, over that country. If we could just get those pesky Americans to follow. <laughs> and there's a problem when it comes to native English speakers, you know, because they are not oh, tested. Oh, tell me. They're not what? Tested. What? They don't need to be tested. Yeah, because... But isn't a, there... Oh, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Go back. But goodness. isn't there... There's like phraseology. There's certain things that they have to be able to, to communicate. They're not tested on that? See, it's not rocket science. So... Well, I am kind of a genius. <laughs> by what I said, I you figured it out. So, yes, they are not tested only because they are native speakers. Everywhere in the world? Native Everywhere speakers, in the world. Native yeah. speakers aren't tested. Are tested. Is they there, are supposed to be at the highest level. But is there a push for them to be uh, well, this? Okay, mm -hmm. well, this is kind of ridiculous that they should be tested because it's not necessarily about their. First of all, first of, I have lots of problems with this. <laughs> oh no, oh no, Tiago. First of all, native English speakers are not always great in proficiency. Second, if they have to do something that's like very specific content-based communication, that, then they should be tested on whether or not they can actually do that or not. Oh my God. Oh my God, yeah. So then, well, no. We've been, we've been really pushing uh, it to change. I mean, uh, we, the association and many other people, we've been working hard to change this. But not only that, but also, so they have some uh, empathy towards non-native speakers because let's take uh, JFK as an example. Mm. They speak too fast and there are standards. I mean, there are uh, guidelines uh, as to how you should speak and the, the rate of speech you should uh, apply when you are speaking mm -hmm. uh, in regular telephony. So. The, the the number of words is limited to 100 per minute that's but they don't care about it oh god they speak 200 250 words per minute sometimes mm -hmm. you know and if if they only if only they could at least speak slower and uh don't use uh local expressions jargon that would be nice but yeah, there are many oh, problems. No, there, has to be stand there has to be standardization across the world. I mean, especially now everything's globalized. There's flights going in and out of every single country hopping from here to there. It has to be standardized in some way. Yeah, ICAO tries, but yeah, when it comes to, to America, it's not an easy task. God, those Americans. They do, they do say, I, I've heard people saying so uh it's your problem it's not my problem because i know english i speak english so you need to learn my language to work with us to work as an air traffic controller or as a pilot no but, but it's as not you about said it's the not this exactly it's not the same language it's it's a subdomain of the english language 
Uh, that's yes. Yeah, that's you a don't little think arrogant so. to say. That's not. I mean, he, but here's the thing. I also have the perspective of a teacher, so I have, in general, I have. I'm empathetic towards these types of things. But if they would only understand that it's not language, it's a form of communication using a very specific kind of set of of of. I guess you could say the set of language as it's repetitive. No, it, it is it is language, but it's not the English language. Yeah, it's it's a, a specific. That's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. It's like a like you said. It's like a subset. It's, it's using very specific language to be able to communicate for a very specific purpose. Oh, indeed, yeah. Well, that's concerning. I'm. If you need someone to fight against the Americans, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you thank no you. I, I mean appreciate it no i i understand though because well i am american but i come from you know i come from that kind of uh environment where i can see how people say well i already speak the language you know and i i can see that happening but it's just they ha they don't realize or they're just kind of ignorant to the fact ignorant to their no fault of their own but just ignorant to the fact that that's not really how it works in terms of communication and language so goodness okay goodness. all right well i don't want to take too much of your time any uh any other tips or hints for people who <laughs> yeah once again the, the question you asked about how can can people become aviation english teachers so again, uh, there are some courses uh, you can do. Uh, here in Brazil, uh, there are people, I myself uh, with Natalia, we, we had a, a cohort uh, in 2021. We taught uh, this crash course, uh, a six hour crash course uh, about how to start teaching aviation English. But outside Brazil, there are many other courses uh, longer ones people can 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 do in order to become aviation English teachers, you know. But you need to expose yourself to to aviation stuff in order to to really get the hang of it, you know, and to become more familiarized with terms, with jargon. Even though you don't, you won't teach it. But uh, how how can you? Teach a pilot if you don't know, uh, don't, you don't know an aircraft uh, and how it works. Uh, at least the basics, you know. But it's important to to learn all that stuff. Well, I think that's that's true for any. I mean, it's good advice, and of course, we'll put your contact information in the the show notes. But for any subset of ESP, you have to be actually interested in the topic. <laughs> You have to have some sort of interest in, because if you, because I'm, you know, I'm mostly a business English teacher. You do aviation. That's because I like business. I'm interested in it. You like aviation. You're interested in the area. So it's not work. Uh, well, I mean, it is work, but it's not troublesome for us to, oh, that's something that I haven't seen before. Let me kind of investigate that. Or I'm curious about what's going on here. It, it's just something that's, that's interesting. So indeed yeah yeah <laughs> uh, that's good that that's good that you and, and natalia have a course though so we'll we'll definitely link everything and we'll link your social media and anybody who's interested can get in touch thank you very much again oh, what a course. pleasure talking to you oh it's been so much fun well, it's I'm... really really nice <laughs> <Okay. laughs> well that's it for today and we'll see everybody soon bye bro thank you Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Real Talk and ELT. Want to join the conversation? Head on over to Instagram at Kelly Pennington ELT and send me a message. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube or Spotify channel to stay up to date. And of course, take care of yourself, your health, your vibe, and your tribe. Until next time.